Dr. Gushal, it's a pleasure to be here. Many years since I visited Lucknow, and uh, it's always great to, to come back to this place. And I'm also pleased to see a few surgeons in the audience as well. I thought I'd be rather lonely and the only person who's a surgeon in this audience. So what I'm going to talk about today is the management of Crohn's disease. Now, Crohn's disease is managed not by just physicians or just surgeons, it's teamwork. Surgeons and physicians, they run joint clinics, they manage these patients jointly. We, in our hospitals, we used to do joint ward rounds and discuss them together so that we had a plan of treatment. And, and I, I'm pleased to see that that kind of philosophy. So when we talk about Crohn's disease, we know that Crohn's disease is a transmural condition. It's panenteric, it can involve any part of the gut. It's characterized by granulomas and skin lesions, which means it's patchy in nature. It can result as complications in stretches, fistulae, and involve the perineum, which is referred to as perineal disease. And it has light colitis, has a relapsing, remitting feature. We can classify, we can classify it according to the geography or the anatomical location. So, which is, if it involves the terminal ileum, it's L1, if it's involved the colon, L2, ileal colon, L3, L4 when it involves the upper tract, and L4 when both the upper and the lower tract are involved. And when we throw in the pathophysiology with it, then you can further classify it. So if it has stricture formation, uh, then it's B2, B1 is without a stricture, B3 is if it's penetrating internally and when it involves the perineum or perianal disease, then it's B3P. So to communicate with the, the, the medical fraternity at large, you can just simply say somebody has L1, B3P disease, which means the ileum is involved and the, the, the patient has perianal disease as well. So it makes communication a lot easier and a lot more specific so that we know what we are talking about. It is becoming more prevalent, but at the moment it's about 44 to 201 per 100,000 patients. So that is the prevalence of Crohn's disease at present, and as I said, it is increasing. Half of these patients, approximately half of them, in their lifetime, will develop perianal disease. And what is important is 20% of these patients will need hospitalization every year. So it's a huge burden, healthcare burden. So one in five, Crohn's patients will need hospital admission every year. And when we look at surgery, about half of them will need surgery in 20 years from diagnosis. So, and the other important thing is that although a lot of new therapies have come on the scene, like the biologics, it has made no impression on the need to have surgery. So, yes, we can keep them in remission, but when it comes to the risk of having surgery, it has not changed. So that brings us to the economic burden of Crohn's disease. How much does it cost to treat this? If we look at the American figures, it costs about 10.9 to 15.5 billion dollars every year to manage Crohn's disease. If we look at Europe, it's not very dissimilar, 2.1 to 16.7 billion euros in the Western countries. And these figures are not current. These are 
from before the biologics were introduced. So if we throw that economic burden in, the cost almost is double. So it's a huge drain on healthcare money. And also, it goes without saying, greater the disease activity, higher the cost. It takes a lot more money, a lot many more dollars to manage that patient who has a higher degree of, uh, greater degree of disease activity. So what, what do we have available to manage Crohn's disease? If we look at medical treatment, this sums up what we have available. We have antibiotics. So a lot of these patients, when they first present to us, they have an element of infection because fluid has oozed out and formed a collection around the involved gut. And that responds quite well to antibiotics and the main stay of that is metronidazole. Steroids, as you all know, are used heavily in the management of Crohn's. Then we have 5-ASA compounds. We have immunosuppressants like azathioprine and the new kid on the block, that's the biologics. And they're coming in sequence. The infliximab was the first one to get introduced. And then many more have come on the scene. I put this slide in because it just reminds me that the focus now is biologics. Everybody is working on some kind of a map. We started with infliximab, we went on to have adalumumab and then natazolumumab and all sorts of maps have appeared on the scene. So that, that is where we are going. What are they and what do they do? These are all anti-TNF alpha antibodies. As I said, infliximab was the first to be introduced, but several others have come on the scene since then. There are concerns regarding the use of biologics, and these mainly are infections, psoriasis, immunogenicity, and cancer. And of course, the cost, which doubles the healthcare cost. Many countries that I've been to, they tell me that they cannot afford to prescribe biologics for their patients, even though they know that it might produce some benefit. What do they do? They induce and maintain remission. They heal gut mucosa. They induce healing and in some cases lead to closure of fistulas. They improve extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's and generally speaking they result in improvement in the patient's quality of life, which is an important facet. You can use them in two different ways. You can either use them in a step-up fashion or a step-down therapy. Now, step-up is the commonest because you've used other modes of treatment and then when they don't work, you end up with biologics. But there are some people who now truly believe that there is no point in messing about, that you simply, when you are presented with a patient who has severe disease, you go straight to biologics and then maintain remission with the help of biologics or other agents. What about surgery? Surgery, as I said, 20% will uh, need surgery within 20 years. But in their lifetime, about half of these patients will need surgery at some stage. <clears throat> surgery for Crohn's disease is not for the diagnosis of Crohn's. It is simply for its complications. We do not operate if somebody has Crohn's disease. Our medical colleagues manage that. It's only when complications develop that surgeons are called. And the complications are strictures, fistulating disease, and perianal disease. So when you are confronted with this kind of scenario, surgeons are all into play. As I said, 80% will require surgery at some stage. And if you break it down, 10 to 
will need from the first operation, this is not the first operation, up to a third will need reoperation at five years. So just one operation is not enough. These patients, they keep coming back with complications and will need surgery repeatedly. At 10 years, 30 to 40 percent will need reoperation. At 20 percent, following uh, 20 years, following first surgery, 50 percent will require reoperating. So the magnitude of the problem, from a surgical standpoint, is quite large, and that has to be kept in mind. Just to show you some pictures. This is what a segment of Crohn's looks like. Uh, I could, I don't know if there's a, is there a pointer? Do we have a pointer? No? Pointer. Mount. So the pointer will not work. Because you see, over there also see three of these mouse. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Just to change the slide when I yeah. try to use it. Okay. Okay, you can see in the middle when there, where there is fat encroachment, that is the area which is beginning to form a stricture. And uh, so that, that's what Crohn's disease looks like. So if I come here and show you, this fat here, this is mesenteric fat, and that is coming onto the bowel surface from both sides, and that's the segment which is affected. Bowel on either side is normal. So that's a relatively mild disease. In a patient with severe disease, you begin to see something like this. Multiple strictures, a combination of long and short strictures. So on your left, at the top hand, you see there's a long stricture there, a little bit of normal gut, and then what we call sandbagging. So that's a short segment of dilated bowel because there is a narrowing further downstream. There's a set stricture further on, then another normal segment, another stricture, another stricture. So multiple strictures and that is what we see. If you look at it further, this is another severe disease which has an abscess formation from a perforation into the mesentery. You can see bowel contents coming out and you can begin to get a picture of how severe this disease is uh, in, in this patient. Another example, multiple strictures, severe disease. So this is the kind of scenario where surgeons are often asked to come and help. Now this is an 11 year old boy that I operated on about 10 years ago. He presented with a stricture which was 70 centimeters long. And in addition, he had multiple other strictures. Nutritionally very compromised, hardly thriving. So what we did was, there was no option. We, we could have just removed 70 centimeters and quite a long length of the rest of his gut, but we elected not to. So instead, what I did was we opened that stricture, as you can see the bowel is opened and you can also appreciate how narrow the gut is. There's hardly any lumen there. So we then reconstructed it in the form of a pouch. And this is the reconstructed result. And we did the standard stricture plastics in the rest of the gut, so reconstructed his gut. This boy has not needed any further surgery since then. He does not need any nutritional supplements. So what we did seemed to work, and it actually did did do the trick. So a bit of thinking, rather than just simply go and resect, throw it in the bucket, leave the, bowel, the, the patient with a short bowel 
does not always help. So, and discussion with your colleagues, a bit of thinking in the operating theater can save not just the patient's life, but improve the quality of their life. I mean, you can imagine an 11 year old on total parental nutrition for the rest of his life. Not a very charming prospect for anybody. Now, I know at the moment this is all laparoscopic, robotic, but all the surgery that I have ever done for Crohn's disease has been done through an incision like this. This is what we use for appendix. This is what I use for Crohn's disease. I do a lot of pediatric Crohn's uh, surgery and that's the scar they get. If you measure it, it's about four centimeters in length. So they hardly ever notice it. And if you're doing it laparoscopically, you will still need an incision like this to, to get the resected bit out or whatever. This is from a pediatric patient. If you want to inspect the bowel, just to show you that you can actually look at the entire length of the small bowel from the DJ flexure down to the ileocecum through an incision like this, or sometimes even smaller. Here you can see part of the colon, the transverse colon, ascending colon, cecum, appendix, terminal ileum, all exposed through a very small incision. What do we do in, when we talk about strictoplasties? This is what we do. You identify the stricture and then you make a longitudinal cut. As shown with the help of a diatomy, that's what I use, but you can use a knife. And then you sew it transversely. So the segment which was stenosed, which was narrow, is now dilated and there is no longer a stenosis there. Sometimes, as I said, you have longer strictures, so you modify the operation. So instead of doing what I showed you in the previous slide, you do this, which is a finny type of strictoplasty. So you open the entire stricture and then you reconstruct, as you can see in the diagram here. Occasionally, it's too tricky for people to do what you saw in the previous two slides. So where in those circumstances where there is a lot of disease and the surgeon is scared to open that disease up, thinking that they may not be able to reconstruct, you simply bypass, as shown in this slide. But it is still labeled as a stricture blessing. And then there are various modifications of that. You can either make an incision which is Y-shaped and then reconstruct in the standard manner, or for longer strictures, as I showed you before, a pouch type of reconstruction which seems to work very well. Occasionally, when there is a lot of disease present and it's not a fibrotic stricture, you may uh, be advised to remove a disc of the involved bowel and then reconstruct it as uh, a strictoplasty, as shown in this diagram here. So, yes, it's all very well to talk about strictoplasties. Does it work? Let's look at some of the data. This is a review that Vic Fazio published uh, from the Cleveland Clinic in 2007. This is a meta-analysis of 23 papers, 1,112 patients, 3,259 strictoplasties. So quite a large experience. 59% of these patients, they've had previous surgery. 61% they needed concomitant resections. And the age range, because it is a disease of the young people, uh, was 16 to 55 years. 
all of these strictures, they were fibrotic strictures, which is a separate entity to strictures from active disease. Most people do not attempt to do strictoplasties for active disease. But that's the uh, experience from the, uh, the Fazio review. Now what happened to these patients? 13% they went on to develop complications from two months onwards to 107 months onwards. Symptomatic recurrence in approaching 40% of patients. 30% they required further surgery for recurrence of disease. And when I say recurrence of disease, recurrence of complications of disease. But the important thing is that site-specific recurrence needing surgery was only seen in 3% of patients. So this was new disease that formed elsewhere, where they had previous resections, previous strictoplasties. By and large, that segment remained disease-free. Who is at risk? of recurrence if you are young, there is short duration of disease and short interval since surgery. Those are the factors, risk factors for recurrence. And the conclusion was that there is no significant difference in recurrence rates after strictoplasty and resection. But there's a huge difference for the patient patient can eat and drink normally, they maintain their nutrition normally, whereas <coughs> if you have resected a long length of gut, then they cannot achieve those functions. Also, there was no difference between strictoplasty and plasty plus resection. So strictoplasty in itself was enough. And of course, there was no incidence of short bowel. Our own experience, uh, this is published data. Uh, my research fellow at the time, uh, Petit Roy, uh, we published this in 2006, 40 patients. But the important difference here is 26 had fibrotic disease and 14 patients had complications from active disease. So this is now a combination of fibrotic disease and active disease. We did 169 strictoplasties, 96 for fibrotic disease, and 73 for active disease. Seven patients uh, in that group, they needed resection as well. 70% of patients, so approaching three quarters, they were recurrence-free and intervention-free at 41 months. So no problem at all. And we saw recurrence in three out of the 14 active disease patients, but none of the fibrotic disease patients showed any evidence of recurrence. And the number of strictoplasties per patient varied. Uh, the majority had one stricture, but quite a number had more than seven strictures. In fact, one patient had 30 strictures. So it just painstakingly used to stand there and reconstruct. And of course, the risk with that is that the more strictory that is involved, the greater the risk of leakage. So you've got to be very careful. But if you see multiple strictures, don't be afraid to reconstruct. You will do well, and the patient will do well as well. What about pediatric Crohn's disease? As I said, I do a lot of pediatric uh, Crohn's operating. Uh, this is an old slide. We did at this stage 47 strictoplasties with no leaks, three operation, two for restricturing, and for all of these patients, they showed improved nutrition and their growth patterns almost came back to normal. So it is worth considering, it is worth doing. So the conclusion overall is it is safe and effective. It protects against short bowel, 
and it compares very favorably with resectional surgery. And as I said, patients are very scared of long, ugly looking incisions. You can do this kind of operating through a very small incision. Uh, any part of the small bowel and the right colon, they are accessible. The other advantage of this incision is that in the future, as I said, these patients will require multiple surgeries. So if you feel that there will be a lot of adhesions in that area, you can always then go to a midline incision because then you can't do it laparoscopically. So you've got to do open surgery and uh, the safest will be to open another area and it gives you access very well indeed. So that's about strictures. What about crow fistulated crows? We look at the lifetime risk of fistula formation in a patient with Crohn's disease, it's 20 to 40 percent. In a tertiary center like ours, we see many more patients with fistulating disease. Uh, 17 to 85 percent of our patients have Crohn's, uh, which is fistulating. And the cumulative risk of fistula formation at 10 years is 33 percent. At 20 years, 50 percent. So somebody who had a diagnosis of Crohn's disease 20 years ago, about half of those will have a fistula, which will need surgical intervention. Likewise, the cumulative incidence of perianal fistulae in a patient with Crohn's is 20 to 23 percent. But if you look at perianal disease, about 10 percent of patients with Crohn's only exclusively will have perianal disease with no evidence of disease elsewhere. So you have to bear that in mind that if you see a patient with multiple crystalline in the perineum, they have anal stricturing, rectal disease uh, in the lower rectum, uh, that is due to Crohn's disease. Just to show you a few <coughs> pictures, this is a patient and who has two fistulae. But note that she's got a midline scar as well. She was referred from another hospital with this sort of condition. Hardly any weight on her. She is emaciated, two fistulae pouring small bowel contents. Another patient, again, previous surgery, as is evident from the scar in the midline, and two post-operative fistulae. What does a fistula tell us? It simply indicates the development of inflammatory process and its extension into the surrounding organs, namely skin and tissues surrounding that bit of bowel. So this is a diagrammatic representation of what I'm talking about. So you have a loop of bowel and there is a lot of inflammation which forms a trap. But another loop of bowel comes and gets stuck to the outside of that bowel and establishes a communication which is a fistula. So that is what happens with the disease process. There is another mechanism and that is this, that if somebody has had an operation, there is an anastomosis, and that anastomosis leaks. It forms an abscess around the bowel, and then it joins up with the adjoining skin and manifests itself as a fistula, enterocutaneous fistula. And that is often bad news because they're difficult to manage. And that observation is not new. This was recorded by Crohn's himself in 1932, who said that the transmural nature of inflammation predisposes to fistula formation. As the necrotizing process of mucosa of the ileum uh, progresses through its several coats, the serosa uh, becomes involved, 
any homo viscous, usually the colon now becomes adherent to the point of threatened perforation. A slowly progressive perforation is thus walled off, but results in a fistulous tract between the two viscera. So this was observed almost 90 years ago uh, by Crohn's himself, and six of his 14 original patients, they had fistula. So right from its origin, it, it's been a recognized entity. How do we assess these people? About clinical assessment, you can use contrast radiology, all the modern gadgetry, ultrasound, CT, MRI, the abdomen and the pelvis, uh, whatever you think is the most feasible, the most suitable, uh, you use that all for perianal disease, we find endovenal ultrasound or MRI very helpful. CT for perianal disease is not, in my experience, very uh, helpful at all. Just a few examples, here you can see the patient that I showed you with two fistulae, so we put two catheters in just to see what lights up. You can see a small bowel on one side and the colon on the other where there is a stricture and a previous anastomosis which has leaked. So it gives you an anatomical guideline to where the problem is. You can do a CT and again you see on the left side, uh, the, the right side of the patient, uh, left when you're looking at it, you can see a fistula there. And there, there's a lot of uh, irregularity and fuzzing in the right iliac fossa, which is where the previous surgery was. You can see the scar in the middle line, and uh, that's where the fistula is. You can see gas in the fistula tract, so you know there is a communication. And there is gas in the surrounding tissues to the small bowel. So when we talk about treatment of fistulating disease, we must have some aims. And the primary aim is to define the anatomy, which is what we did through our investigations. Often there is a collection of infectious material. So you drain the associated infectious material, and then your aim has to be to eradicate the tract. Otherwise, you'll keep refilling the, the space around the bowel and you will never get rid of the, the fistula. And then the ultimate game, that brain and aim is to prevent recurrence of that fistula. Antracutaneous fistulas, they are almost exclusively related to previous surgery. As I said, you get a leak from the anastomosis which establishes itself as a fistula. They very rarely occur spontaneously. It's always following previous surgery. So due to an anastomotic leak, residual disease or recurrent disease. And often, not always, but often they will require fetal diversion, either a, a colostomy stoma or an ileostomy stone. The treatment depends on the location of disease, severity of symptoms, number of fistulae, complexity of fistulae, and whether there is an abscess present or is simply a loop of bowel stuck to the, the undersurface of the skin and uh, subcutaneous tissues forming a fistula. If we look at the role of medical agents in the management of fistulating disease, five ASAs have no evidence of effective healing. Steroids, I will urge you not to ever use steroids for the management of fistulating disease because use of steroids may actually be harmful for the patient rather than help in the management of fistulating disease. Metronidazole, the ciprofloxacin, which we don't use now. If we look at the data, 
Bernstein, he presented some data on fistulating disease and the use of metronidazole in the 1980s. They saw complete healing, more than half of their patients at eight weeks. But look what happens in the months afterwards. 78% they had symptomatic recurrence of the fistula. Overall closure rates of 40 and 50% reported by uh, <clears throat> Jacob Abitz, uh, in 1984. And sometimes a combination <coughs> of drugs such as metronidazole and azathioprine may be quite an effective way of treating particularly perianal disease. Similarly, 6MP and azathioprine, they can be effective in fistulating disease uh, in uh, controlled trials. So when we look at, again, some of the data at uh, present at all in 1980, they reported 40 patients with 55% overall response, complete healing in about a third of patients, uh, but with ASA only, the healing rates were 30%. The pooled odds ratio favoring healing following treatment with 6MP and ASA are 4.44. And this was Pearson's data reported in 1995. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus, it's effective in patients who are not responsive to 6MP and azathioprine, but the relapse rates are high. So as soon as you stop the cyclosporin, the fistula uh, comes back. In 1999, a trial of 94 patients, this was a placebo-controlled multi-center trial. In the standard infusion at two, uh, <coughs> zero, two and six weeks, and the response was defined as 50% reduction and the number of fistulae maintained at four weeks. Overall, 68% response, 55% in the treatment arm, 13% in the placebo arm, and uh, the 55% they showed complete closure. And the time to closure in this trial was three months. Another trial reported in 2002 on 26 patients, this was using infliximab, uh, 26 patients, similar infusion, response again defined as 50% reduction, uh, maintained at four weeks. Overall, 69% response, six patients show, showed complete closure, surgery required in 14, and six continued with draining fistulas. So not a great uh, response to infliximab in this trial at least. There are factors that influence that. Smoking in particular, it increases the, the risk of getting ileal disease and also increases the recurrence uh, following surgery. When there is no response or when there is non-response to medical therapy, it is often due to fibrous genotic disease, high CDAI, and abscess formation. Common sense kind of scenarios, really. So finishing off with perianal Crohn's, how do they present? Skin tags in about 37%, fissures in 19%, fistulae 29%, Anal ulcers in 12%, hemorrhoids 9%, about 54%, more than half of them will have some kind of a perianal lesion. And this was data from Mike Keithley and Bob Allen, reported in 1986. You can classify them as primary and secondary. The primary are fissures, cavitating ulcers, skin tags, hemorrhoids, whereas the secondary are abscess, fistula formation, and stricture formation. Anal ulcers, they are simply deep transmural fissures, which then form a fistula subsequently, 
up to about a half of patients with Crohn's will develop a perianal fistula. And the incidence of developing perianal fistulae is high in patients with rectal disease. So the implication of that is that please do not forget to examine the rectum in somebody who presents with anal lesions because you will miss the diagnosis of Crohn's. This is data from the Mayo uh, showing the distribution of fistulae, so perianal in about half, enteroenteric in a quarter, and then the rest in rectal vaginal and others. This simply shows that as time progresses, the risk of developing a fistula rises. Just to show you a few examples of what anal disease or perianal disease looks like, this is a patient with uh, the anus shown in the middle, and you can see fecal matter coming from the fistula right at the top on your left. There is another patient with healed and active fistulae uh, from Crohn's disease. This is a patient with deep ulcers. Uh, at the anus, and in addition to that, on the patient's right, there is an active fistula. Another patient with multiple fistulae, and another one with a lot of scarring, fistulae, and an ulcer. So how do we assess them? Clinical examination, in my experience, endoanal ultrasound is one of the key things that gives you a lot of important information on perianal disease from any source, let alone Crohn's disease. You can use MRI scanning, uh, EUAs, or sometimes a combination of these factors, EUA and endoanal ultrasound is often very useful for MRI and EUA. <coughs> is needed to make an accurate assessment, an accurate diagnosis. Just an example of endoanal ultrasonography, you can see uh, fistulas, uh, like I'm going to show you here. You can see this white dot there, there's a fistula there. You can see a fistula tract here. You can see a fistula here and a fistula there. It gives you a, quite a precise assessment of where the fistula is. On the MRI, you can see the, the fistula tree as it opens into the uh, rectum and the anal canal. Treatment options, you have medical options and surgery. Antibiotics, when it comes to medical options, they form the mainstay of medical management of anal disease or perianal disease. And up to a half of these patients, because there is involved sepsis around the perineum, they will show some response to your medical therapy. And it's not treatment for one week or two weeks. I will leave them on antibiotics for a minimum of three months if you really want to see good response. And sometimes you can use antibiotics as a bridge to azathioprine therapy. So azathioprine will take time to, to take effect. <laughs> so you can start the patient on uh, metronidazole and then start them on azathioprine at the same time <clears throat> and withdraw the, the metronidazole when azathioprine kicks in. Again, if we look at the results with azathioprine, up to 50% healing uh, reported in 1995 with cyclosporin, 83% in initial response, but as soon as we convert the patient to oral therapy, the, the disease recurs. And in Flixibab, again, about 50% or just over 50% uh, achieved fistula closure in the excellent true trial. <coughs> If you look at a recent meta-analysis of all of this, reported in 2016, anti-TNF 
in approaching 1,500 patients. This is a case series, complete fistula closure in up to 93%. Recurrence in up to 40%. But when it was randomized and placebo control, which is four studies in that meta-analysis, there was no significant difference between closure or recurrence rates. So it shows you the, the, the importance of level one evidence. When they looked at CETON fistulotomy, done in 305 patients, complete closure in 13.6 to 100%, but recurrence was 0 to 83% as well. And when they combined CETON and anti-TNF, there was complete closure in 100 against 82%, and recurrence, again, in a much smaller percentage uh, compared to uh, just TNF alone. This meta-analysis had some limitations as well. The group was heterogeneous. The sample size varied from one paper to another. Duration of anti-TNF alpha treatment and seat on placement was not mentioned, and the follow-up was short. So it wasn't gospel, but it gave us a guideline as to which way to turn. So the principles of Surgical treatment, adequate drainage of sepsis and perioperative antibiotics, adequate assessment, drainage seton to prevent further abscess formation, stoma, which will show initial improvement in a very high percentage of patients, and definitive surgery only in the presence of fistulae. Proctectomy has poor wound healing and formation of perineal sinuses under these circumstances. So do not consider it as a first option. Just a few examples. This is a patient with multiple fistulae which were laid open. And then this is a rectovaginal fistula treated with aceton. And just to finish, if we look at the difference in fistula in ANO with and without rectal inflammation. If you take patients who have no rectal inflammation, they show excellent response and a very low rate of recurrence. And the, as a guiding principle, you treat them with standard fistulotomy without any hesitation. On the other hand, when you examine the patient and there is evidence of rectal inflammation, <coughs> if you treat the fistula in a patient with rectal inflammation, they will be late healing, the recurrence rate will be high, and often they will develop incontinence. So the management, where possible, has to be conservative, or as conservative as possible, rather than take your scalpel and just lay it open, because that will put the patient at a huge amount of risk. So that, I think, brings me to the final slide, which is a summary, and that is perianal involvement is common in Crohn's disease. Accurate assessment is essential. For simple fistulas, antibiotics and immunomodulators will do a good job. Simple fistulas with rectal inflammation resist the temptation to surgical treatment. Uh, instead, use antibiotics, immunomodulators, and biologics. Consider surgery as soon as it is indicated. So by that I mean if, you, if the patient has an abscess, it's no good giving them infliximab or any other form of medical treatment it's not likely to work, and in fact, it will make the patient worse. And often, a combination of surgery and medical treatment gives better results. Thank you.